we're in the middle of a series that we're talking about. Uh, it's called New Life. And please put your phones on silent, okay? Uh, the world can do without you for the next 30 minutes. So it's, it, the series is called New Life. And this morning's topic is a new communication, how to talk to God. If you don't have an outline, the ushers can give you one at this time. It is 10.33. Give me about 30 minutes of your time. But this next 30 minutes may be, uh, I'm like a good salesman right now, but the next 30 minutes may be the most important 30 minutes of your life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like that. You like that? Something happens when we pray. Algo pasa cuando comenzamos a orar. If there is something that the devil, el Señor lo reprenda, if there's something that the devil will fight tooth and nail to prevent you from doing, is to spend time in prayer. I am serious as a heart attack right now. Because something powerful happens when you bow your knees and you pray to God. It is one of those benefits that we have as believers that when you come to Christ, Alfred, you are given free access to the presence of God. Not by your own merits but by the merit of what Jesus did on the cross by shedding every drop of his blood on your behalf. Sin, and we're going to talk about it in a little bit, sin has kept us away from the presence of God. And, and my friends, all of you have sinned. And the Bible says that all of you have fallen short of the glory of God. Ni uno aquí se me pasa. No one here says, I am good enough. But by, by the precious mercy of God, he gave his son to pay for our transgressions and our trespasses. And he says, he says, Father, I will pay. And because he did that for us, now we have access to the throne of grace. But here's the thing. Most of us fail to realize that. And we don't pray. The devil, I don't know if this has happened to you. But the moment you start praying and the moment you take the time to, can somebody, uh, Marquitos, do me a favor. Can you give me one of these chairs right here? Just and bring it up, bring it up on stage. I don't know if it has it ever happened to you that Everything is fine. You're having a great time. Thank you, Mijo. Thank you. We'll put it right here. You're having a great time, and, and there's something that's been aching you, and the whole day you've been thinking about, and you say, Pastor, when are you going to get uh, to the notes on the outline? Give me one second. I want to get there. As my children would say, chill, okay? Relax. Chill, Dad. You've been thinking because there's something that's, that's weighing down your heart. Something that you know, something that you know that the Holy Spirit has been telling you, hey, you need to bring this in prayer. Because let me, let me tell you this. The Holy Spirit will remind you, Chris, that you need to pray about it. But he cannot force you to go and pray. The Holy Spirit will tell you, you need to pray for your children. And you know that you have to pray for your children. But he cannot force you to do that. And, and you say, okay, I have all the good intentions to go and pray. And the moment you do this, and, and let, let me know if this has happened to you. The moment you do this, and you say, I've, 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 all the day I've been thinking about this moment where I'm going to pray. And the moment you bow your knees and you pray, you start thinking about the oil change. You start thinking about the new series on Netflix that is going to come out that has been sending you notifications for the last week and it's not... You know what I'm talking about? And you start thinking, what am I going to do tomorrow? You may even start thinking about ministry things. But when you pray, there's a deluge of ideas and thoughts coming to your mind. 
Because the enemy knows that the moment you pray and you bow your knees, something is going to happen. But my main concern this morning is to tell you how can we take, take advantage of this benefit that we have in the new life. I, I tend to believe that for any relationship to be successful, we need good communication. Let me see, let me see who's married here. Don't you think married couples or married people who are here, that communication is key? Absolutely. When you get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the opposite, okay? When you, when you get mad with your spouse, what's the first thing that you stop doing? Huh? I'm, I need to pray for some of these couples this morning. <laughs> when there is a break, when there is tension, we stop talking. Ooh. You know where I'm going with this, right? There's a disconnect. In order for any relationship to thrive and to flourish and to blossom, let's say between the two of you, if there's something that bugs you, you need to let her know. You say, ah, you're so being macho, I want to... Bro, no, uh uh. I'm really macho. I can deal with it. No, you have to tell her. You know what, Mikhan? This bugs me. We need to fix it. Prayer is communication with God. We will not thrive in our relationship with God if we don't pray. And you say, well, <laughs> the disciples noticed that Jesus was a man of prayer. So much that in the main text of this morning's sermon, the disciples reach out to Jesus and they, tell, and they ask him, Jesus, can you please teach us how to pray? And the first thing you're going to fill in your outlines, we're going to talk about the person of prayer. Who is this person of prayer? The most perfect example of someone that prayed was Jesus. There is no other individual in the Bible that, that, can, that we can learn from about a life of prayer and the impact of a life of prayer like Jesus. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, Luke 11, 1, he had finished. One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. Teach us how to pray. What that tells me is that prayer is a spiritual discipline that can be learned. It is, it is encouraging because I can realize that there's some things that I can learn from the life of Jesus that I can incorporate into my life to have good communication with the Father. 52 times, 5-2 in the Gospels, we see a reference with Jesus and prayer. His life was so marked by the impact of prayer that the disciples took notice and said, there's something that he's doing that we need to learn from. You have that preacher, young preachers that you like. I, I was a young preacher at once. I was. And, I, and, and, and back then, Alex, I'm, I'm going to talk to you because you're a preacher. Back then, I, mijo, I had no YouTube. No, no Instagram. Now you can look at a thousand preachers and pick and choose which one you like. Stephen Furtick, whatever, whatever right? Back then, mijo, we had video cassettes. <laughs> Some people are going like, what is that? Well, yeah, we had cassettes this big, okay? And I know that when I started preaching, one of my favorite preachers was Alberto Motesi. Because I was saved. On, he was here a few, a few weeks ago, right? And I know that one day I stepped to preach and I had my little Argentinian Mexican accent. And my, my, and my brother said, Juan, you're not Argentinian. Stop talking like Motesi. But because I saw the impact that he had, I wanted to be like him. Don't, don't look at me like you don't do, ever do this. And I know I'm talking about the preacher, but if you play soccer, you want to play like Ronaldo or like Messi. Right? If whatever you do, you look for an example, someone that is doing their craft that you can learn from them. 
Jesus was the perfect example of someone that prayed. And the disciple says, Jesus, can you please teach us? Because we're seeing that you are doing something that is making a difference in the world. When he prayed for the sick, he prayed. When he healed them, it was backed up by a life of prayer. When he broke the bread and began to feed the 5,000, he prayed and he blessed them. When he calmed the storm in Galilee, he was, the Bible says that he was probably underneath, but he was probably praying, oh, Lord, I know they're coming and they're going to wake me up. And he gets up and says, be still. The disciples knew that Jesus was a person of prayer. Now, if, if you're good at what you do and you love people the way you should, you're not going to keep it to yourself. And again, the best example of this is Jesus. Because right after they ask him, can you teach us how to pray, he gives them a pattern, which is the second point in your outline, which helps us outline what's the right way to pray. Because God wants us to grow in our life of prayer. So he gives us an outline or a prayer, and it reads like this, and this is in verse 2. It says, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, this is commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. And what we're going to do for the next few minutes, maybe the next five, six minutes, we're going to look at different aspects. And please realize that for the sake of time, we cannot go into depth because we can literally spend an entire sermon series about the Lord's Prayer. It is so deep and so charged with with so much powerful, but I will just do light brush strokes that we can take from and gather so we can learn what this pattern is. The first thing that I want you to fill out in your outlines is the recognition of our source. When you say, Father, Father, you don't go to any stranger and you call them Father, do you? No, you don't. When you, when, when, I'm going to say my children, right, when, when they say, Father, can you? That's an acknowledgement because a father usually represents a relationship. There's a level of trust. I know that my children would never ask you things they can only ask me. Because the relationship is with their father. So what Jesus is teaching us in the first thing is that we must acknowledge that we have a father whom we are related to because we've been purchased by his blood, by the blood of Christ, that we can trust that the Father is a good Father. Does it ever realize, does, do you ever think about why did Jesus, of all things he could have shown God, why did he choose to represent him as a Father? He could have called him the Almighty, right? The All-Powerful. The all-knowing, but he decides to portray God as the Father. Because it is the only way we can acknowledge that we have someone that we are deeply connected with him. And someone that not only do, are we connected, but we can trust. And also when, when it says, hallowed be thy name, or hallowed be your name, it represents a, 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 a style of recognition that you are above all things. There is a danger in the church today that we, don't, we fail to realize how holy is our God. When, I, when I'm giving you a free pass into the, in the, through the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus, it is never meant... To undermine the holiness of the God we serve. The Bible says that he is holy, holy, holy. But because of this relationship that we have, we can say, hallowed be thy name. 
In Spanish, it's santificado. That means it is so enthroned in the heavenlies, but we're given access because of who he is. The second thing that I want you to see here is the resignation of our selfishness, which is verse number two. It says, your kingdom come. I'm going to give you a little secret. Do you want to pray effectively? Do you want your petitions answered? Pray, Father, let your kingdom come. Um, should be point number two. Are you just giving them time to write down? There you go. <laughs> the resignation of our selfishness. We live in a society that is me-centered. Would you agree with me this morning? We live in a society that it is what's in it for me. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. And that, it is so counterculture to the Lord's Prayer. Because the one thing that Jesus is outlining in, in the second point is that we should pray, your kingdom come. And again, I, I, I need to refrain myself because I just want to go into this, into what that means, but I, I can't. But it behooves you to ask your kingdom come. It is a good thing when his kingdom The third thing is the renewal of our supply. Give us each our daily bread. Have you ever heard that song, one day at a time? That's the way you should live your life. Remember when the children of God were in the wilderness, in el desierto? They would get manna for a week. No. They would get manna for how long? One day. One day. When Jesus is telling his disciples, you're going to pray this, and this is the pattern. Father, give me a renewal of my supply daily. I mean, I tell you till I'm turning purple to have a devotional every single day. Which, which by the way, we have some devotionals for $3. Thank you. You said that you didn't remind me. <laughs> we have devotionals. Take one home, please. $3. Because you need to feed yourself, Marquitos, every day with the Word of God. You know, when, when and this is kind of mean. And I have a mean side to me as well. When I see somebody that is really flaquito, okay, really skinny, I go, man, that boy needs a couple of cheeseburgers. <laughs> and my children tell me that is very mean for me to say. But why am I saying this? Because when you don't have that daily renewal, that daily supply of the Word of God in your life, you are going to be malnourished. You're going to be sick. You are going to be weak. The fourth thing that we see here is the repentance of our sins. So we're praying, Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, right? Thy will be done. Give us each our daily bread. And number four says, and forgive us our sins. Every, every moment of prayer should, should involve a, a, an intentional declaration that whatever I'm doing wrong, Father, forgive my sins. Because sometimes uh, we sin... And we may not even know it. And that's difficult to say. But sometimes we do things that, that dishonor God and we don't realize it. Say, Pastor, I haven't been drinking. I've been smoking. Can I tell you that sometimes not trusting God is sinful? I, ouch. Can I tell you that sometimes doubting God dishonors him? So we must ask, Father, forgive my sins. And even those, even David said in, 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 in Psalm 51, forgive those sins that are hidden from me. Because sometimes we'll do things that are hidden even from us. We need to ask for forgiveness. Number five, the realization of our shortcoming. And it says, and lead us not into temptation. 
Do you know why we need to pray this? Because even the most powerful and most spiritual of us, Ricardo, can be weak at times. I have moments of weakness. You have moments of weakness. Hampton has moments of weakness. You think Ledesma has moments of weakness? We all do, brothers and sisters. We all do. That's why we pray, lead us not into temptation. Have you ever noticed that when you are trying to seek God more, more close, that when you are making an effort to walk closely to God, Adriana, have you noticed that temptation is just right there? Lead us not into temptation. But the crowning point of this prayer, although it's not found in Luke chapter 11, it is found in Matthew chapter 6, which is number 6, which is the rejoicing in our Savior. It says, it's Matthew 6, 13, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So when you pray all these things, all this pattern, there's five different steps the crowning point of this is yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we have the person of prayer. We have the pattern of prayer. And just in case the disciples didn't get it, because sometimes they didn't have their coffee. Sometimes they had a difficult day at work. Sometimes they wouldn't get all the concepts that, teacher was, that Jesus was teaching them. Just in case Jesus gives them, number three, a parable. Because sometimes you'll forget the sermon and the outline that I'm giving you, but you will not forget the stories, right? Have you ever noticed that? That sometimes you ask your children, what did, the pastor, what did Pastor J.C. talk about? Oh, I don't know, but I know he talked about his children. I know he talked about his wife because we're good at perhaps forgetting the little details, but we don't forget stories. Jesus knew that. So he gives them a parable that kind of nails down the whole concept of prayer. Let me read to you. Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. And this story has to do with prayer. And goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, let me, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, do not bother me. The door's already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. I don't think he was his best friend, but anyway. Yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. We have two dilemmas in this parable. The number one, is you're going to fill this out in your outline. The one thing we have is a dilemma. What to do. Because if, if you were going to pray about something, if you were this man, would you go out into your friend's house? L let's assume that I went to your house, Alex, in the middle of the night and said, Alex, I need some Wonder Bread. <laughs> I ran out. A lot of us will not because we want to refrain ourselves from upsetting anyone. So we have a dilemma. Is it, am I going to bother someone in the middle of the night? Right? And, and Jesus is trying to teach them a principle about prayer. Am I, am I, am I not going to be bold because I have a need? Am I going to just be quiet and remain passive? What am I to do? And the second dilemma that we find here is, it, it's still a dilemma, but the second one that I see is, what if my friend doesn't have wonder bread? What if he doesn't have what I am looking for? But immediately Jesus wants to make a point, and he teaches them about the determination that this man had. And he said, and from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. And let me, let me jump to verse 8 for the sake of time. And it says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now, there's, there's different ways that you can knock on someone's door. I know that sometimes... You know, your children will come into your bedroom and say, Mom, are you awake? 
very delicate, right? Have your children ever done that in the middle of the night after watch a horror movie, right? Mom, are you awake? But then, right. then there's also the curious way, Mom, and why am I saying mom? I could be saying dad, right? Mom, are you there? Kind of in a curious way, right? Then I, I, I'm a salesman. I've told you that, right? I have a different kind of knock. I have a, I have a business knock. Very assertive. Hello, I'm Juan with Ferguson Facility. How you doing? Right? right? But then there's another way, which is the way that Jesus is telling him. Hey, and I'm, I, I don't want to break the, the glass. What, what, what was it? Like, hey, open. I need something. Jesus is telling us that when we pray, that's the way we ought to be. I'm not telling you, Jesus is telling you. That we need to be that bold in a way that we are persistent. And you may say, well, Pastor, and the beauty of parables was that they took elements from your daily life and they kind of contrasted different behaviors and different scenarios, right? And, and I want to point out a few things that we want to contrast between that friend and God, our Father, who is the one who is going to answer when you seek, when you knock. Well, number one, with God, it's never midnight. With God, it's never midnight. This friend was bothered because it was in the middle of the night. I think, and uh, Alfred, if you came to my door at midnight, brother, I don't know if I would open my door. Because at midnight, I don't even know if you can wake me up, to be honest with you. But with God, it is never midnight. God never sleeps. There is no night and day because he's not limited by time and matter like we are. So we can be assured that with God, it's never midnight. With God, number two, God is never, listen, look at me for one second. Look at me. I need everyone's eyes on me. Even Matthew, Luisito, look at me. God is never bothered when we come to him. Can I have one amen? amen? You will never bother God, Isaac, when you come to him. I know that sometimes you want to talk to me and you say, Dad, I don't want to bother you. Yeah, because you can bother me sometimes. Straight up, bro. Bro. Straight up, bro. <laughs> the kids, that's what the kids say now, parents. If you have me called bro, you will eventually, okay? But God is never bothered when you approach him. And I need, to, I need you to have that confidence. You will never bother God because he wants to. In fact, in Matthew 7, 7, it's not in your outlines. Write it down. Matthew 7, 7. Jesus told them, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Keep knocking. Number three. God never, never, ever, ever, ever will run out of resources. In fact, you will run out of needs for that God can provide for. Does that make sense? There's no limit, Richie, to what God can do. When you ask something from God, say, God, that's impossible to you. Ha, 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 he laughs at you. Because there's no impossible to him. He is the God of unlimited, unlimited resources. Whatever you can... In Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that he can do much more than we can even think or understand by the power that works in us. And I'm kind of translating in my brain because I know this verse is in Spanish. But he is so unlimited in his resources. He is unlimited. Number four, God is never taken by surprise. Never Never. You say, I'm going to approach God and I'm ashamed of this or I need this and it's too big. He already knew when you were coming. He knows. He knows. God sees every one of your steps. Number five, God gives us with pure motives. This friend got up not because he was, oh, yeah, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you bread. No. The Bible says, Jesus, he got up because he was just annoying. I'm, I'm putting it in, in 2023, paraphrasing. He said, enough, I'm done, look, go. Go. Not God. 
God is not going to just cast you away. His motives are pure because he sees our need. Amen. We have the person, we have the pattern, we have a parable to nail down what Jesus was trying to teach us. But we have a progression of prayer. Luke 11, 9, verse 2, 10. Seek. I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. I want you to say everyone out loud. One, two, three. Everyone, everyone who asks, receives. Is there something that you need to ask God for? James says that you haven't received because you don't know how to ask. Just saying. The word keeps ask. The word tells us to keep asking, to keep seeking, to keep knocking. And when we do this, listen, we are co-laboring with God in the establishment of his kingdom. You know that God is in heaven. We are on earth. So what God is wanting to do, he needs to do it through every one of us in this church. Let me tell you, it's in your outlines. To stop asking, to stop seeking, and to stop calling is to stop changing and growing. And let me finish up this morning. I told you I was not going to take that long. To seal the deal when it comes to this new confidence, to this new communication with God, we need to realize the promise of prayer. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. And I'm going to use, I'm going to use Alfred. Because you're here and you have a young child in Matthew. Let's say that Alfred, Matthew says, Dad, I want a fish taco. Will you give him a snake instead of a fish? And can you see I'm making it a little bit more personal? Because sometimes we read the Bible and, and we think it's so year 33 D.C. Or A.D. Or, uh, okay, you understand. Okay, A.D. We don't realize that that word is speaking to us right now. So let me bring it to 2023. Alfred, will you give him a snake if he wants a fish taco? I don't think so. Or if he asks you for an egg omelet, I'm, I'm on verse 12, okay? I'm a little translating here. Will you give him a scorpion? Would you? Then, if you, being evil or not a good person, know how to give good gifts to Matthew, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And, and I'm wrapping up this morning. And Jesus is in his infinite wisdom. He doesn't say if he gives you a car or a home or bread. He tells if you will not give his Holy Spirit. What does it have to do with my resources or my needs, Pastor? Everything. Because the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth and righteousness. The Holy Spirit will lead you into that which is good for you. Why do I need that, Pastor? Because sometimes you, yourself, don't know what's good for you. Am I, am I make, am I, am I, can somebody hear me out this morning? Ricardo, there's been times in your life, brother, when there's things that you think they're good and they're not good for you. Aunque no digas amen. We've gotten into messes, my children. When we think we want something, we think it's, the, it's good for us. In Ruby, it is not this way. So when you ask something to the good Father, pray that he gives you his Holy Spirit. Why? 
Why? Because they want to know why. Because the Holy Spirit will teach you what's good for you. And then that pattern kind of falls into place. Let your kingdom come. Let thy will be done. As it is in heaven, let it be on earth. This new benefit of this new life, we need to take advantage of it, church. In a few weeks, I'm going to be sharing with, with the whole church in all three services. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about, yeah, you know, I'm going to do three sermons in one day. I'm going to talk about families living around the holy hill. Because there's something reserved for families that serve God together. And in one of those key components is prayer. How we pray for our children. The devil has been trying to steal our children. But, but you, I'm giving you, you have two children that are, that are away. And you can't be there with them all the time. But God can. But when you get an agreement and you pray and you protect them, ooh, God is going to do the impossible. The only thing is most, most parents don't pray for their children the way they should. And they leave their children endangered with an enemy that is prowling them, that is coming after them. But there's, but we cannot, we cannot, I'm already preaching that sermon. Come on, stop me now. Because I, <laughs> stop me now. Stand to your feet, please, this morning. Ruth Graham, you, everybody, anybody heard about Billy Graham? Great man of God. I, I always believe that behind a great man of God, not behind, right beside a great man of God, there's a woman of God. His wife was an incredible component of his ministry. She was a woman of prayer. And Ruth Graham said, God has not always answered my prayers. If he had, I would have married the wrong man several times my friends when we truly grasp the benefit of this new communication we'll discover that it's much more there's so much more than simply getting our prayers answered it is if getting what you want if getting what you want is the premise of your prayer life you will miss the promise of a life of prayer Close your eyes with me, please. Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray. Help me prioritize those precious moments in the course of my day to ask for your guidance. Teach me, Holy Spirit, how to pray for my wife how to pray for my children. Teach me, Holy Spirit, how to pray for the ministry that you've given me here at CFC Chapel. Jesus, we want to be like you. We want to grow. We want to live out the purpose of our calling. But we know that it will only happen as we engage in this new communication with you through prayer. Take us to that frontier, Lord, where anything can happen. Where there's a new world that needs to be discovered as we usher into your presence. I pray that every person under the sound of my voice will make time, will prioritize those precious moments to devote them to prayer and to seek your face. I bless every person under the sound of my voice that we may yearn and just long and thirst for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love you and God bless you. We'll see you next week. Amen.